All right. So we're moving into lesson three here. America, isolation is isolationism to wartime. Um, what do we have going on here on the, in this political cartoon? What a lucky thing. We've got separate beds. Ho hum. No chance of contagion. Stalinich, Hitleritis, Blitzpox, Nazi fever, fascist fever. What's going on with this cartoon? Yeah. Um, this is Dr. Seuss criticizing us for like, oh, lucky us, we're not involved in all that. That's it. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Dr. Seuss is really, oh, Italian mumps down here. Dr. Seuss is got a couple of things going on here. He's highlighting the isolationism, but the beds, we've got a Western Hemisphere, and this, this is a representative Western Eastern Hemisphere of sort of like a Monroe Doctrine type of idea. So we have Uncle Sam resting well while the rest of Europe is suffering from the rise of fascism. Um, we're going to look at Dr. Seuss as we move forward into lesson three and four today. I actually highlight Dr. Seuss in a bit about his wartime background when we talk. I've, I've got a portion of a lesson related to journalists, cartoonists, and reporters during the war that we'll talk about more in depth about him as we move forward. But I do have a couple more cartoons to share of Dr. Seuss's today. So, Andrew's research on the London Conference was spot on. The London Conference, the goal was to come up with an international fix to the Great Depression. This is also known as the London Economic Conference. So, if you're doing some research in preparation for the midterm, don't get it confused with the London Conference's that were held earlier. I don't know if you came across that problem. Yeah, I did, because there's like a whole list of like the London conferences that happened in London. Right, right. It's kind of like treaties of Paris. There's a laundry list of those, it feels like. Um, so FDR really wasn't in step with the other 65 delegations. I'm glad Andrew brought up the point that um, Cornell Hall, Secretary of State, is the guy that's leading our delegation. And the whole theory here is notably England and France are trying to stabilize global currencies, but they're pushing to stabilize the value of the American dollar. Do keep in mind, America, as a result of the Depression, has gone off of the gold standard. And remember, we're using that Keynesian style of economics, the pump priming, inflationary tactics. So that really doesn't help our economy in the long run. So John Maynard Keynes, um, is going to support FDR's decision and really the, to sort of clear through the weeds here, why? Because the dollar rose against foreign currencies, it threatened U.S. exports, and it certainly threatened stock and commodity markets on Wall Street. So without America's participation in the London Conference, nothing got accomplished. It's a whole lot like the League of Nations all over again, America's non-participation solidified our isolationist policies in terms of economics. In war and in the economy, we're going to go it alone while military aggression goes on the rise. Here we have FDR post-London conference. This is what we would consider what style of FDR speech, where he gets on the radio and everybody kind of tunes in to get filled in. Fireside, chat. fireside chats. Remember, the fireside chat started with him explaining what? What did he sit down just about every day after he was elected to explain to the American people? His policies. What policies? The Yes, very good. He sat down to explain the New Deal programs, like the FDIC, the bank holiday, the 
Civilian Conservation Corps, et cetera, et cetera. That style of communication with the general public continues in the pre-war era and also in the post-war era. Another thing to add here too is by the start of the war, a lot of folks are gonna be filming, and it's not television as we, as we know it, but they're gonna be filming speeches, they're gonna be filming events, and then those that footage ends up at the movies, theaters, and there becomes this massive propaganda campaign as well. What's up, buddy? Um, at what point did the majority of Americans have the radio in the household? Because uh, uh, that, that radio was available to most Americans before FDR, but it was just one of the first ones to experience it, or it was? So the first radio broadcasts are in the 20s. By World War II, I would say that everyone has radio. It would be hard to say that everyone had a radio in the Depression because that wouldn't have been a priority. By World War II, that would have been a priority to know what was going on. In fact, that'd be kind of a cool thing if you guys want to look that up real quick as we move on. What, what is the difference between 1930 and 1940 look like? Obviously, a lot of radios would have sold in the 20s because as Gavin was, I think you're getting ready to point out, that would have been a pretty big boom time. Yeah. There were there were there were other competing um, music outlets during the 20s as well, like Big Trump was really big. Um, I'd take a record player. Yeah. Ever seen one? Like crank it? Yeah, I've seen one. My yeah, mother my mother owns one. Like it's pretty yeah, interesting. Is that the thing with like the giant yep. Yep. Exactly. Like the thing the RCA dog sitting yep. next to. Um, without knowing, I could, without knowing the exact statistic, here's what I would bet. Radio sales were probably pretty strong from 1925 to 1929, 30. And then they probably went into decline until people started getting employed and had the money to purchase them. But there's something to also think about. Radio companies, there were a number of different companies, and they were probably all in competition. And there's a chance that they may have overproduced and had an overstock. So it might not have been that difficult to get them in the 30s. But if you would have owned them in the early 30s, you probably would have sold your radio for food. Yeah. I'm just looking it up. What's up? Okay. Cool. All right. So Michelle said we're pretty close to that. I again, these are the reasons I wish my grandmother was still alive because I always appreciate her perspective. Because she would say that's what they did. Like her and her girlfriends, when they got off work, first thing they did was went to the radio. So they could figure out what was going on. They could listen to music, etc. So we'll talk about the home front a bit later. All right. So let's look at the tidings McGuffey Act. Um, McGuffey Act. Uh, this one was uh, passed in 1934. Remember, we take occupation of the Philippines as a result of the Spanish-American War. This had been an imperial quagmire. You all remember who the Filipino revolutionary was that we backed and then we turned our backs on him. Emilio Aguinaldo. We supported his uprising and we sent in military forces and then once we defeated the Spanish, we occupied it. Why did we occupy the Philippines? Imperialism, territory. Give me a couple of other reasons why. Territorial expansion. Resources, as in sugar, yeah. military bases, very good. There's also another policy that our occupation of the Philippines is relevant. Well, it's a, it's a governmental policy that we want in China. 
I can't remember the name of it, but if we're there, that's one less person to turn against us. Right. It's called, it was, it was pushed by John Hay, who was Secretary of State under William McKinley and Secretary of State under Petty Roosevelt. It's called open door policy, meaning we want to be, we want to have a foot, we want to have a footprint in China, and by having a footprint in China, we're going to have to get a group of islands and a group of um, ports to be able to do that. So this is really the the Philippines opens up a larger door in the Pacific. This is why we wind up taking Hawaii, we wind up taking Wake, Midway, Samoa. All of those are not only for fueling stations and for military bases, but they're also for va valuable resources. What valuable resource can America capitalize on in that region? Sugar. Very good. Sugar and fruit, right? And look at the the, the people that started the military coup d'etat in Hawaii with the Doles. Yeah, the fruit family. All right, so this had turned in, and I'm glad Gavin brought this up, this had turned into a bit of a nightmare as a result of political corruption, as a result of economic corruption. In fact, up to the point of the American sugar growers, they were looking to move out. And the majority of the sugar plantations were controlled by Americans, French, British, they were not controlled by Filipinos. So the goal was to get out of the Philippines. So the Tidings McDuffie Act in 1934 said the Philippines would be independent after 12 years, 1946. Well, we don't get to see that all come to fruition because Japan is going to invade the Philippines shortly after, not just months after the, the attack on Pearl Harbor. During this period of time, FDR will formally recognize the Soviet Union. This was not very popular in America. Do keep in mind, post-World War I era into the era of the Depression was America's first Red Scare, led by A. Mitchell Palmer. That was the fear that communism would spread to the United States. And also keep in mind, there is communistic, anarchist, socialistic party factions in America during this period of time. I guess it would be kind of funny to say the anarchists had a party faction. Um, that's, they had a movement, um, for sure. So this is a political cartoon in response to the Tidings McDuffie Act. And it says, I wonder if he'll ever be satisfied with his old suit again. And what it's just showing you, it's sort of America as like, this imperial uh, sort of might in the in the Pacific. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's a good point. Um, FDR and the good neighbor policy with Latin America, notably Mexico. In '33, with the inaugural address, obviously FDR lays out plans for the New Deal, but he also lay, lays out a uh, ambition to be a good neighbor with Latin America. At the Pan American Conference, FDR announced that the United States would no longer use military strength in Latin America. He singled out TR, his fifth cousin's big stick policy, as particularly bad policy. Also keep in mind that the United States under General John J. Pershing during Wilson's administration had battled Pancho Villa on the border of the United States and into Mexico at the start of World War I. The next year, 1934, the last of U.S. Marines that had occupied Haiti would be removed. That occurred in the Wilson administration as well. America lessened the influence in Cuba and Panama, despite the fact that we still controlled the Panama Canal at this point. Mexico did see some oil properties as a result of this seeing it as a, as a pushover policy. Some oil companies did lose some monetary, or suffered some monetary losses, but FDR stuck to the policy. It was fairly successful in, in improving American relations with Latin America. I will say there's an important factor 
that we're going to look at moving forward. That's a lot of Latino and Mexican American enlisted men that are going to volunteer their service at the start of World War II as well for the United States. Latinos will be integrated, notably Mexican Americans will be integrated into the United States Army. So here we have FDR with the good neighbor policy and obviously get very racist cartoons here, meeting the good neighbors, Uncle Sam's top hat and a sombrero. The reciprocal trade agreements were led by Secretary of State Cordell Hull. This was a push to move away from the hardcore high restricted tariff of the Smoot-Hawley tariff or Hawley-Smoot that was passed by Willis C. Hawley and Reed Smoot, one of the nails in the coffin for the Great Depression. The idea was to lower tariffs to expand global trade. He felt trade was a two-way street, so Congress is going to pass the RTAA, the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act, on June 12, 1934. So this is one year to the day of the start of the London Conference. As Andrew pointed out, the London Conference went on for nearly a month. It didn't end until July 33. There was a lot of focus on trade with Latin American countries through this, this uh, tariff cut. And really what it cut down was the most offensive parts of Holly Smoot. And it amended a lot of that restrictive tariff. Remember, Holly Smoot, that was a retaliatory tariff policy that levied tariffs on roughly how many goods? You may remember how many goods were, were taxed or, or tariffs were placed on? Mm -hmm. Too many, 20,000, 20,000 goods, all right? So this started to re reverse the high tariff trend and this actually, this low tariff trend will continue into the, into the post-war era. Why do you think the Government's going to want to keep low tariffs in the post World War II era. It did encourage trade, and it's also going to encourage some policies like the Marshall Plan that was instituted to help rebuild Europe. We'll talk more about the Marshall Plan. There's Secretary of State Cordell Hull from Tennessee, longest standing Secretary of State in American history, 11 years. Jackson, good job on your research for Cordell Hull, father of the United Nations. So what's the American response to Europe's Axis dictator alliances? Well, the short answer here is very little. Post-World War I chaos and the Depression helped spawn the totalitarian regimes that we've talked about. Stalin takes over after the death of Lenin. Mussolini just overthrows the Italian Prime Minister and the Italian government, and Hitler takes control of Germany after the death of Paul von Hindenburg. Hitler appeared to be the most dangerous <clears throat> in the minds of, of most Americans. He was a fantastic speaker, told the big lie that the German, German problems and the causes of their downfall could be blamed on the Jews, the Treaty of Versailles blamed on the Jews in the post-war era, the loss of their dignity. They must return to greatness which ran in their blood, spawning the start of the Holocaust. American officials knew what were happening, thanks to William Dodd's reports back to Hull and FDR. That is a book that on the life of wood, or not the life of wood, Dodd, it does cover his life, but the time that William Dodd served as ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Germany, he's got Virginia roots. He went to Virginia Tech. He was a, he was a history professor. He lived in Round Hill, Virginia. Y'all familiar with where Loudoun County is? Not kind of 
not it's outside DC. Kind of cool. My cousin actually lives on William Dodd's farm now, and they turned it into like a larger development and a golf course. I don't know if William Dodd would be too thrilled with that. But uh, Dodd's reporting back what's going on, and you guys can again. I, I, I re highly recommend this book. It's written by Eric Larson. The book's called In the Garden of Beasts. Very, very cool book. Very quick read, too. Something else to keep in mind is Germany hosted the 1936 Summer Olympics. Hitler wanted to make it bigger than the previous games had been in Los Angeles. He built larger, a larger coliseum, <coughs> more facilities. And this is the first games that will be broadcast on film. These film, these, it's almost sort of like documentary style, and then the film clips are sent to movie theaters and people can watch them. It's also, it was broadcast on radio as well. Jewish athletes in Germany were barred from competition, and most of the com countries competing barred their own Jewish athletes not to offend Germany. One really great thing that occurred at these Olympics was that African-American Jesse Owens won four gold medals in the 100, 200 meter, the long jump, and the four by 100 relay, and that infuriated Hitler because that smashed the theory that the, his Aryan blonde hair, blue-eyed, white, young German athletes were superior. So this is Ambassador to Germany from 33 to 37. And then there's Jesse Owens, Olympic gold medalist in Berlin. Did anybody choose Garden of the Garden of the Beasts? By Larson? In the Garden of the Beasts, rather? If you if the book you're reading right now is, is moving a little slow, think about Think about that one for your review. All right, let's take a look at American response to Japan. Obviously, the military dictatorship of Hideki Tojo begins with the invasion of Manchuria. They become an imperialist nation. They want predominance in the entire Pacific. <clears throat> they ignored the American Washington Naval Treaty from 1921 to 22, this starts a naval arms race, but America didn't intervene. They also walked out of the London Conference in 33. They quit the League of Nations in 35. But it didn't really matter because America backed out of the London Conference, and we weren't members of the League in the first place. The invasion of Manchuria occurs in 1931. America condemned the attacks. Henry Luce was instrumental in bringing this to America's attention. He's the founder of Time and Life magazine, also Fortune. He was the founder of that magazine as well. Um, he was uh, born to, Ch to uh, American missionaries in China in 1898. So he had a particular interest in the events in Manchuria and China. He's also a staunch supporter of Chiang Kai-shek. 1940, Japan joined Germany and Italy in what will become the Axis powers. Anybody ever heard of Henry uh, Luce before? No? Yeah? Okay. All right, so We'll talk more about him as we move forward, too, because <clears throat> the stories that are published in Time and Life are going to be tremendously important for allowing the public to understand what's going on the war front. And there are all types of American report reporters that are on the ground. They are reporting. And in our text, you're going to read about some of those people. Have you guys? Come across a guy by the name of Ernie Pyle yet? He's one of the greatest wartime correspondents in American history. 
we're going to talk about Ernie Pyle a bit later. Brilliant correspondent, correspondent, brilliant writer. Let's talk a little bit about the Johnson Debt Default Act. This is named for Hiram Johnson, a Republican from California. He had served, he'd been elected governor. He ran for vice president in 1912 on the Bull Moose ticket with Roosevelt. Didn't work out. He did make a bid for president once. That didn't work out. So he ends up getting elected to the Senate, and he serves in the Senate for a number of years. He's an interesting character. He's a Republican, he's a progressive, but he's also an isolationist. So a little bit of contradiction there. That really wasn't typically the party line to be progressive and uh, isolationist. So what this proposal was was to prevent the United States from lending any nations that would default on the lending to any nations that would default on their loan. Again, he was a staunch supporter of the isolationist movement. And he wanted to try to avoid America getting sucked into any further foreign problems. And Congress is going to go along with it, and they're going to pass the Johnson De Debt Default Act in 1934, which forbade countries that owed money to the United States from getting any more loans. I love this picture of Hiram Johnson. Um, Republican governor and later Republican senator from California. That's a that's a sort of like a tough on. He's a regular. He's a progressive. So he was all about regulation, being tough on corruption in the state of California. Another isolationist group. Hiram Johnson was part of this group. They're called the Nye Committee, led by Gerald Nye, a Republican from South Dakota. It was set up in 1934 to study the idea that munitions producers only help start wars and thus earn profits. This is one of the ideas that came about in World War I. What group in particular do you remember was bringing that up in the World War I era? In fact, he was, this guy was not only a labor leader, but he was also a political leader, and he ran for president. Can you name him or name his party? I'll give you one more hint. He ran for, pre for president from jail. And his campaign button is him in a jumpsuit. Oh, and it says, vote for prisoner nine... 805 or whatever his prison number was. It started with a That's his, his union was the railway union. But his political party was the Socialist Party. His name was Eugene V. Debs. Eugene V. Debs. He was the guy, he's the guy that originally <clears throat> touted that line of the only reason that this war is happening is for the munitions factories and the mechanized factories to make more money. So what the Nye Committee was all about, they were pushing for neutrality. So they pushed the Neutrality Acts passed in 35, 36, and 37. They said that when the president declared that a foreign war existed, certain restrictions would start with these Neutrality Acts. Here are the restrictions. America, Americans could not sail on a belligerent nation at war ship, sell or haul munitions, or make loans to belligerents. Clearly all those things still happen, but those were the regulations. These were, you know, made clear to avoid sort of the same mistakes that occurred with the onset of World War I, like the sinking of the Lusitania and the Arabic and the Sussex. World War II has obviously some very different circumstances. The United States is going to declare absolute neutrality, and that's where we're going to end our day, or end our lesson, with that last neutrality act. So here we have Gerald Nye, Republican, North, North Dakota. 
Did I say South Dakota earlier? Did I say North Dakota? North Dakota. Um, so he is the leader of the Senate Munitions, Munitions Investigating Committee and the leader of the Nye Committee, named for himself. That's pretty interesting. Uh, that was a very, very uh, popular hair the slick back here to using the dapper dan. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. All right, so America and the Spanish Civil War. Spanish Civil War, obviously, is a staging ground for World War II um, for both multiple groups, the Spanish, the Nazis, and the uh, Italian fascists. So it saw a fascist government that's going to be led by General Generalissimo Francisco Franco. They fight a Republican Democratic group, but remember we talked about the complexity of that. There were factions within. Naturally, the United States is backing this Democratic Republic, but we're not offering any help. The best we did was we placed in an oil embargo, and some Americans actually volunteered for the war effort. The most famous American that's tied to the Spanish American or the sorry Spanish Civil War is Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway was a war correspondent for North American Newspaper Alliance. He was under fire at a number in a number of different battles in uh, the Battle of Ebro, the, he was like one of the last people to get off the field. Um, and while under fire in his residence, uh, he wrote the fifth column, his only screenplay, while working as a war correspondent. Italy and Germany goes on to help Franco, providing Panzer, plane, and blitzkrieg tactics. Also, entire troop movements. Franco and the fascists won, and that helped embolden Hitler. So on the left, we have Generalissimo, and on the right, we have Hemingway in the field with Spanish revolutionaries. Any Hemingway fans out there? Okay, it's me. All right. I encourage you to read some Hemingway. All right, a little bit about the quarantine speech. Japan invaded China in 1937, which we already know. FDR did not name the action a war. However, he wanted to invoke an embargo, and he decided to give the quarantine speech, which asked America to quarantine the aggressors, Italy and Japan, for Italy's invasion of, previous invasion of Ethiopia and movements into North Africa and Japanese invasion of Manchuria, now China. And it was sort of like moral rhetoric, but it ultimately, the quarantine speech will be steps toward embargo. If you're wondering why an embargo is not placed right away, Roosevelt's advisors and cabinet were, were deeply divided over whether to push an embargo or not. Not to mention the Chinese and the Japanese lobby and the Chinese and Japanese ambassadors that were in their ears. Now talk about the Chinese ambassador, or not, or not ambassador, but the Chinese lobby. I did TV Song, the Harvard graduate. He has a great deal of, of influence here. Another Harvard gra graduate that was one of one of uh, FDR's advisors, Tommy the Court, he is getting sucked into the embargo talks as well. The Panay incident, <clears throat> on December 12, 1939, the Japanese bombed and sank the American gunboat, the Panay, on the Yangtze outside of Nanking, or the Yangtze. Um, Two are killed, 30 are wounded. This is possible grounds for war. Japan apologized, paid for the damage. The situation cooled. 
Americans in China, however, were jailed and beaten as the Japanese took out their anti-American frustrations. The Pan Am incident did not warrant a declaration of war, but people are, are starting to, to get hawkish. Nye and Johnson are going to stand firm in their isolationist beliefs. Here we have sailors on the, from the Pan A. And then the bottom there, that is the USS Pan A. <clears throat> so, increasing problems with Hitler's treatment of Jews. Hitler broke, obviously was breaking the Versailles Treaty, making military, man, mil, military service mandatory in Germany, building up their armaments, marching troops into places like the Rhineland. And the United States did little to respond, despite the warnings from Ambassador William Dodd. Unlike the man that would replace Dodd, Hugh Robert Wilson, Hugh Robert Wilson was anti-Semitic. He actually tried to praise the good in Hitler as ambassador, and he called his time as ambassador to Germany uh, a pretty good club, meaning that you know that he he kind of took advantage of the benefits that the Nazis were, would provide to an ambassador that would support their ways. Dodd was an outsider. He was not in that, he was not in that camp. So obviously the Holocaust was inspired by Hitler's autobiography or memoir Mein Kampf, and then obviously the more permanent and more detrimental Nuremberg laws because that's rhetoric. This is actually law, law, and those laws are going to be enforced. Jews are being corralled into ghettos as early as the mid 1930s, relocated to labor camps, finally to death camps to carry out the final solution. The United States is going to turn away thousands of Jewish refugees for a number of reasons. Isolationism, immigration restriction, fear of espionage, anti-Semitism. This infuriated FDR Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau. He came from a prominent Jewish family in New York and fought for Jewish refugees. He later proposed the Morgenthau Plan. It didn't come to fruition. The plan was, after World War II, to prevent Germany from ever producing a weapon again. That was the Morgenthau plan. Top left, those are the gates at Auschwitz. Our Bayat Macht Frey, with work comes freedom. Bottom left, these are the train tracks that brought Jews in boxcars into Auschwitz. Top right, these are Jewish children in striped pajamas. And I don't think that, I don't know if that's Auschwitz. It might be another camp. I'll, I'll look that up because we're going to have a different, a completely different lesson on the Holocaust. And then that is Henry Morgenthau on the bottom right. So this is where we pretty much wrap up the Neutrality Act of 1939. So Hitler's invasion of Poland, America is rooting for Britain and France, but we were still committed to neutrality. The neutrality acts were invoked, which cut supplies to belligerents, but this was really tested on September 3rd. The British passenger ship, the SS Athenia, was sunk by German U-boat 30 on September 3rd, 1939 like maybe let's call it 40 30 40 miles off the coast of ireland they're heading toward belfast from montreal to belfast and you guys can look you can pinpoint that if you'd like um 28 americans of 117 passengers died as a result of the attack FDR wants, and wants to help Britain and France. 
So Congress is going to pass the Neutrality Act in 1939, in November of 39, and it said that the United States would sell war materials on a cash and carry basis, meaning no credit and no U.S. ships hauled the supply. This was technically open to Germany too, but it was meant for Britain and France and to help their navies that were struggling. It sort of improves our moral standing and it opens up the door for what policy? Lend what? Lend lease. Very good. Lend lease. So here we have FDR's announcement of the 1939 Neutrality Act, and then below is the SS Athenia. A couple of Dr. Seuss cartoons. All out aid to our allies. This just shows us circling the wagon, circling the boat, with Uncle Sam at the helm. And then I really like this one. Neutrality Act, aid that will win, but the Neutrality Act is holding the aid back. The old man of the sea. Yeah. All right. You guys have any questions?